All right. So um, this chapter, uh, chapter 13, we're going to be looking at uh, fluids and how can we describe fluids um, using uh, the mechanics or the equations that we already know. And what you're going to find out here is that a lot of the equations that we've developed up to this point can be applied uh, to describing uh, how a fluid works. Um, they've been pretty successful up to this point in being applied to rigid objects, um, particularly simple ones. And then we figured out how to augment a lot of those rules uh, for objects that are more complex in shape. Well, um, now we're gonna take a look at how we can apply those to uh, <clears throat> um, a, a body there that doesn't really have a solid shape. And how can we describe uh, the characteristics about it? So that's what we're gonna be doing in this particular chapter. So first thing we'll start off here with is the summary. We're gonna be looking at uh, density and you've probably already been fairly well uh, familiar with that particular concept. Uh, and it's gonna be mass per unit volume. So if you've got a mass M of a material that has a volume V, then the density is going to be the ratio of the two, mass over volume. Uh, there are gonna be some things that we do talk about here. Uh, specific gravity is gonna be the ratio of the density of a material to the density of water. So a specific gravity is actually just going to have a number associated with it. There won't be uh, any units because it's gonna be density divided by density. Pressure is going to be defined as the force per unit area. And assuming that the pressure is constant over the area in question, we can express pressure as um, the force that is perpendicular um, to a particular area divided by that area. So um, Pascal's law, let's see exactly how many more do we have to go here, okay. Uh, Pascal's law stated that the pressure applied to the surface of an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to every portion of the fluid. So the total pressure at any level in a fluid is the external pressure uh, plus the pressure due to the weight of the overlying fluid. So the pressure at a depth H below the surface is going to be this. And basically what that means is if you're, you take the pressure at a fluid surface and you know what the density is, then, and if the uh, fluid is open to the air, then you know that the pressure is gonna be equal to the atmospheric pressure. Um, then the pressure that is, uh, you would see at a depth H is going to be higher because you have all of the pressure of the atmosphere coming down on it, plus you've got the pressure of the fluid that's over you. So this is the relationship here. This is gonna be Pascal's law. Absolute pressure is the total pressure in a fluid. In other words, if you were to go through and if you were actually going to combine all of the pressure within the fluid, then you would know what it is in an absolute sense. To an extent, uh, really, that's not as useful for us uh, as, say, the gauge pressure. And that gauge pressure is going to be the difference between the absolute and the atmospheric. So the SI units of pressure is going to be the Pascal, and that's going to be Newton divided by uh, meter squared. Uh, additional units of pressure are going to be the bar, and uh, one bar is going to be 10 to the fifth Pascals. You've got the tor, which is one millimeter of mercury, and you may have seen that uh, pressure uh, measurement before. Uh, if you go into uh, uh, nursing or whatnot, you, you might still see that particular measurement. Also, um, 
uh, weather forecasting may have that uh, as well. Uh, and then, of course, you have the uh, the atmosphere, which is a, a you know almost the same here as one bar. Uh, you can see the how the uh, number of pascals differ slightly. Um, and then you can see, you know, one atmosphere is equal to this many pascals, uh, which is equal to 760 tors, which is equal to 1.013 bars, as if you didn't have enough to worry about. So um, we can see here that the pressure, let's say we've got an object, and this object is uh, immersed within uh, this beaker. And you've got the pressure of the fluid coming down on top. So whatever that pressure is uh, times the area. And that's going to give you the force here. So think of this again as a free body, uh, not quite so much as a free body diagram, but a diagram of the forces nonetheless. You have the weight of the object uh, being pulled down. You have uh, pressures coming in this side as well as this side, which if this is a uniform fluid or whatnot, these two should cancel out. And then you have the pressure uh, being pushed up against the uh, area here at the bottom. This is going to follow Pascal's law. So let's go and let's take a look here at these sections individually. All right, so you can see here that these objects may have um, different masses, but they would have the same density. Because the density here is an attempt to try to take volume into consideration. You may uh, sometimes hear of things, uh, measurements of, you know, different demographics or whatnot being measured per capita, where they try to take, um, you know, a certain activity going on somewhere and they're going to divide it by the number of people in order to try to figure out how common this is per person. And it's a way to try to compare uh, a large city with a small city. Well, the same kind of thing is going on here with density. You are taking uh, an object here that's fairly large, takes up more volume, uh, and you're taking what its mass is and dividing by that volume to try to get at how dense that material actually is. Same thing with the nail. So you can have things that have the same density but aren't the same shape and you know uh, take up less I mean, one object takes up less volume than the other. I've seen our definition of density up to this point. Um, again, this is going to be mass divided by volume. Uh, units here, kilogram per meters cubed uh, is a, a common way uh, to describe that, although you can find many other torturous uh, units, uh, accommodations to, to throw at this uh, if you're ever bored one day. Um, the densest material found naturally on Earth is the metal osmium. Um, that's a new one, didn't, didn't know about that. Um, the density of air at sea level is going to be this. Um, if you start taking a look at some of the strange objects that actually inhabit the universe, uh, neutron stars really do kind of take the cake uh, because that's like one step above a black hole. So if you could actually go and pick up some of this material, that's how, which you can't, but if you tried, this is the density that you would most likely uh, encounter. So here you see a table of how uh, certain um, objects have certain densities and uh, how they compare with one another. Again, we've covered the specific gravity. Uh, specific gravity is a, a material's density uh, divided by the density of water. Again, it's unitless. Uh, specific gravity of aluminum is 2.7, and basically what this means is that aluminum is 2.7 times um, uh, as dense as water. I they suggest here that relative density would probably be a better word, but uh, as specific gravity just kind of stuck. So. If you're into uh, pouring lattes, you can kind of uh, 
use different uh, liquids with different densities to try to get them to all stack up. I am nowhere near that good, so I don't even bother. So you have several problems there with density that you can go through. Um, <coughs> hey, Katie, how's it going? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Oh, just living the dream. Um, found out uh, today that I passed my uh, comprehensive examination uh, for master's in physics. So hopefully here should be getting that uh, degree in May. Be nice. So that's great. Yeah, um, that's actually um, uh, quite a load off the mind. <laughs> so. When a fluid um, is at rest, then it's going to exert a force that's perpendicular to any surface in contact with it, such as the wall of a container or the surface of a body that's immersed in it. So let's say you've got a surface here located within the fluid. Uh, the fluid on either side of the surface exerts forces on it. Uh, if the fluid's at rest, we know that the forces must be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, otherwise, the surface would accelerate and the fluid would not remain at rest. So um, these must be oriented perpendicular to the surface. So similar, similarly, any surface of an object immersed in the fluid is acted upon by a force perpendicular to the surface. Otherwise, if this force were not perpendicular, it would have a component of shear that would cause the surface to accelerate. In other words, you might start to see a spin or something of that, or bending. So um, you've got two different surfaces here that differ in orientation and area, but the pressure on them is going to be the same. Again, if you're looking at pressure, it's a ratio of perpendicular force to area. So it takes that ratio into consideration. Um, pressure is a scalar. It does not have a direction. Again, the units are newtons per meter squared or pascals. So you may have heard of, uh, as we have just discussed, a, a bar. You may have heard of a millibar, which is another way of writing this particular measurement. Um, the British uh, units of pounds per square inch, or PSI, uh, is used. I don't know if um, either of you guys uh, put air in your tires, um, but uh, a PSI is usually what is measured uh, on the tire. If you will look on the tire, you can kind of see it there. Um, and that is a measure of uh, the gauge pressure that you should be reading on that. And if they're underinflated, which I would always encourage you to check your tire pressure because um, underinflated tires are as much of a danger as overinflated tires. You don't want to be running around on that. So um, another unit of pressure is uh, the atmosphere, which is what they're defining here. We kind of went through that in the summary. Um, the average atmospheric pressure at sea level is used as a unit of pressure. So we're going to say that this is uh, around uh, average atmospheric pressure. So if the weight of the fluid can be ignored, then the pressure in a fluid at rest is the same throughout. That's a generalization. It makes calculations easier. It's not really true to a large extent, depending on what you're trying to do, but we just make the assumption here. Um, the reason atmospheric pressure is greater at sea level than on a high mountain is because there's more air above you at sea level and a greater weight pushing down on you. And when you dive into deep water, your, air, your ears are going to tell you that the pressure is increasing rapidly. Well, that's not a surprise. When we go through and we define uh, Pascal's law here, uh, we're going to define H as zero as being the 
top of the liquid here that we're immersing something in. And the depth at which you're going is going to be a value H. So we know <coughs> that the height of this particular object is going to be uh, uh, at depth H below the surface. Um, the area of each of these surfaces is going to be A. We're going to call this a, a cube. The height of the element is H. Uh, the volume is going to be H times A, which is probably not a surprise. Uh, the mass is going to be the density times the volume, which is going to end up being a PHA. And the weight is going to be uh, mass times gravity. So if you take uh, the mass this relationship right here substituted in for here, then we can write the weight as this. So if we take a look at this diagram here, we see the pressure coming down here times the area. So that's going to be that force. We see the forces on either side. We see the force uh, of the weight uh, of the object as if it were at the center of mass. And then we can see the pressure coming up from the bottom. It's all the molecules down there pushing up on this. Um, these two again, uh, this one and this one cancel out. And we're left with this. We're left with the pressure down there at the top. We're left with the weight. And then we're, uh, we've got the uh, force of the pressure over here. This fluid is in equilibrium. If it's in equilibrium, then the pressure coming up, which we'll define that as the positive direction, minus that, minus that should end up being zero. <laughs> we can take that expression here, substitute in all uh, of these terms, uh, the G, the H, and the A. Since all of these terms have the same area, the same um, factor of A as part of the area, we can go through and divide through and take out the area there. And then if we rearrange those terms and make them all positive, this is what we come up with. So this is Pascal's law, uh, just uh, derived from the uh, force diagram that we had uh, previously. So, so at a given level, the pressure P is equals the external pressure or the atmospheric pressure, uh, plus the pressure due to the weight of the overlying fluid, which we have now derived to be this, where H is the distance below the surface. So this is pressure as a function of depth. So pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to every portion of the fluid and the walls of the containing vessel. The pressure depends only on depth the shape of the container does not matter. So if we take a look here at 13.6, we've got an enclosed liquid here. And what do you notice about all of these uh, four different chambers? Where's the liquid in all of those? Or oh, the top of the liquid, I should say. If you look at it, you'll notice that the liquid, the, the top of the liquid is all at the same level. This is the level at which the pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. At any level below the surface, the pressure is going to be the same in all four of those arms. Well, that's kind of cool. Um, that gets in to discussing, well, how can we take that and use it to our advantage? This comes in play with hydro hydraulic jacks, and that's going to be shown here. Um, a piston with a small cross-sectional area A is going to uh, exert a force with magnitude F on the surface of a liquid, uh, say oil or you know water or something like that. So whatever that pressure happens to be is going to be transmitted through the entire liquid in the pipe. 
Because of that, uh, we're going to see that same pressure be transferred here to this part of it where the area is different, it's larger. So since the uh, two pistons are the same height, they experience the same pressure. So we can see what the force here is going to be um, if we know this, this, as well as this. So <coughs> a small force is applied here to a small area. And at any given height, the pressure is going to be the same as it goes all the way through. And then you get a force that can actually support a car if this area is big enough. So basically, this is a force amplifying device with the amplification factor equal to this ratio. Uh, this is used by dentist chairs, car lifts and jacks, uh, elevators, hydraulic brakes. So that's an interesting little principle there, how you can get away with, uh, with doing that kind of thing. Um, in many situations, we're gonna be more interested in pressure differences than the absolute value of the pressure. Uh, this again, is talking about car tires. Um, if the pressure inside a car tire is equal to atmospheric pressure, uh, then your tire is going to look rather flat. And it doesn't matter what the outside pressure is, um, your tire is flat, you're not going anywhere, at least in that vehicle. So for the tire to support the weight of the car, uh, the pressure inside the tire must be greater than the pressure outside of the tire. Uh, obviously we want it to be greater than the atmospheric pressure. So the quantity of interest is going to be the difference between those two pressures. I mean, we don't really care what the absolute pressure is inside the vehicle, uh, the vehicle's tires. We just need it to be greater by a certain amount. Uh, here it says 32 pounds, so 32 PSI. So what we're saying here is uh, that it is greater, the pressure on the inside is greater than the atmospheric pressure. So the total pressure inside the tire could be 47 pounds per square inch. Uh, the excess pressure above atmospheric pressure is going to be referred to as the gauge pressure. Total pressure is going to be the absolute pressure. Um, that's actually the gauge pressure is of course what the gauge measures. Um, if you have uh, ever used a tire gauge, then you can see an example there of what uh, gauge pressure actually means. All right. Um, one of the simplest uh, pressure gauges is going to be an open tube manometer. And you're going to see that here. Um, you've got um, at this particular height, the pressure is the same on both sides of the tube. So, in other words, we know what the pressure is uh, at this particular point. And if we know it there, then we're also going to know what it is here. <clears throat> so we've got a liquid inside one end of the tube is connected to the container in which the pressure is to be measured uh, at the other end it's going to be open to atmospheric pressure according to pascal's law then the fluid pressure at any given level in the right hand tube must be equal to the pressure in the left hand tube uh, if we choose this level to be the fluid surface in the left-hand tube, then the depth uh, in the right-hand tube being, can be represented by H. So on the left side, the pressure at the surface is just simply going to be P naught. And on the right side, it's going to be the atmosphere plus whatever this difference is. So if you equate those two expressions, this is what you find out. And since at this level, they would be the same. We wouldn't care what the atmospheric pressure is. The gauge pressure is just gonna measure the difference, which is just going to be this. Here you have a mercury uh, barometer where you have uh, 
this it contains a near vacuum where the pressure is equal to zero. Here you have atmospheric pressure. Uh, if the atmospheric pressure increases, then it would push more mercury up here. So the level to which uh, the mercury rises depends on the atmospheric pressure exerted on the mercury in the dish. So this is an interesting application here regarding the snowshoes. Um, if you walk in fresh snow without snowshoes, obviously your feet sink because you're exerting too much pressure for the snow to support. But if you go out and get yourself a slick pair of snowshoes, uh, preferably before the snow falls, that way you don't have to worry about trying to get back down, uh, that's going to reduce the pressure you're exerting by distributing your weight over a larger area, allowing you to walk across the top of the snow without sinking in significantly. So that's always something to remember. Um, so we kind of went over and discussed that. Uh, and then we discussed the barometer there. Sometimes we express pressures in terms uh, of a corresponding mercury column, as in so many inches of mercury, or probably what you've seen more often is millimeters of mercury. So the mercury barometer reads atmospheric pressure in millimeters of mercury uh, directly from the height of the mercury column. And if you want to know why we call some of the pressure uh, tor, or some of the units for that, it is af after uh, Evangelista uh, Torricelli. I'm sure I might be that name to some degree. Uh, and he's the person that, uh, or she, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, usually that's a feminine ending there for a uh, name. So, hmm. um, and then it's the inventor of the mercury barometer. Um, Obviously, that depends on the density of mercury, which does vary with temperature and on the value of G, depending on where you are. So the Pascal is going to be the preferred unit of pressure. So, um, here's an interesting little uh, discussion. Uh, blood pressure measurements uh, are um, an important diagnostic tool because if your blood pressure is too high, uh, you're going to put more force against the walls of the arteries, which is going to eventually cause them to wear out. And if you don't have an artery that is able to transport blood, or if you get a tear in it, or uh, a blockage, um, you've, you've got some major problems. Blood pressure obviously varies with height, uh, so the standard reference point is going to be the upper arm level with the heart. Um, Usually, usually you're going to measure blood pressure with the word that everybody who wanted to be a part of a spelling bee wanted to know how to spell this before uh, the spelling bee ever began uh, because it was the longest word any, anybody in the eighth grade would ever remember. And it's called the sphygmomanometer. Sphygmomanometer. Say it with me. Sphygmomanometer. So this is an inflatable cuff that you place around the upper arm. And um, let's see, the cuff is inflated by squeezing a flexible bulb, which you've probably seen. That increases the pressure on the arm. So you got a stethoscope uh, that's used to detect the pulse at the elbow. So when the pressure in the cuff exceeds the blood pressure, an artery under the cuff collapses and the pulse is no longer detectable. And the pressure itself is measured with a mercury manometer or a mechanical pressure gauge. So, um, kind of go through this. Uh, so the nurse is going to listen through the, the stethoscope for the arterial flow uh, while letting the cuff deflate. So flow starts when the pressure in the deflating cuff matches the arterial pressure. Uh, blood pressure is actually a measure of two pressures. So you've got the systolic pressure at which blood first starts to spurt discontinuously. 
through the compressed vessel and the diastolic pressure at which blood flows continuously. So I think there are two sounds that they listen for. And um, the systolic, I think, is going to end up being the one at the higher pressure, and the diastolic is going to be the one at the lower. That may be more than you ever wanted to know about that, but there you are. So these things actually do have an application. So uh, moving on here to Archimedes' principle, buoyancy. Archimedes was, uh, I believe, uh, said to utter the word Eureka. Um, and I believe it was because he uh, was thinking about Archimedes' principle in a bathtub. So there we are. Um, uh, this states that when an object is immersed in a fluid, the fluid exerts an upward buoyant force on the object equal in magnitude to the weight of the fluid that the object displaces. This is the key principle behind why ships stay afloat. Um, if you go out and you actually look at some of these massive super tankers that you've got out there, I mean, you would think, well, they're made of steel. And, you know, steel is um, obviously uh, a lot more dense than water. So why don't these things actually sink? And the reason for that is you're looking at the amount of water that these things displace. And if they displace less water, or if they just, let me back up again. If the um, density of this ship uh, actually displaces enough water that is actually uh, denser than what is currently going on on the ship, then that's how the ship continues to remain afloat. Now, there's obviously going to be more to it than that, but that's the general that's the general principle. So, an object that is denser than the surrounding fluid sinks. Uh, one less dense than the surrounding fluid is going to float. So you can see the diagram here. So let's say you've got this um, oblong object here that's kind of cut out. It's got the center of gravity here. You've got the buoyant force and then you've got the weight on the fluid. So the pressure on any volume element of the fluid produces a buoyant force that exactly cancels the element's weight. And the reason that is, is that if that were not the case then you would see an acceleration of that. And in, in a still uh, um, jar or beaker of fluid, you just, you don't see that kind of motion. So this must be what, an accurate model of what's going on. So the buoyant force on a solid object is equal to the magnitude of the weight displaced by that particular fluid. So if you take this object or this amount of water out, you cut it out somehow, and then you replace it with an object. Well, the buoyant force is still going to be a pressure and it's going to be applied there as if that water were still there. If the water obviously is uh, removed and replaced with an object that's less dense, then that buoyant force is going to be greater than the weight of that object and that object is going to start to float. If, however, the object is more dense, then there it goes to the bottom. So again, let's take a look here. We've got this arbitrary object. Uh, the forces on the fluid element uh, due to pressure must sum to a buoyancy force that is equal to the magnitude of the element's weight. In other words, that's what's going to keep it suspended. Um, the forces here uh, outside are gonna be the same because the water is, or whatever the fluid is, is gonna be exerting the same pressure no matter what doesn't matter what's on the inside, it's going to be exerting the same pressure from the outside. <coughs> so um, obviously all the Y components of the forces are going to end up summing to zero. Um, wait, did I read that right? Um, uh, let's see, the sum of all forces I can chosen an element of the fluid, yeah, must be zero. Therefore, the sum of the Y components of the surface forces must be an upward force in magnitude, equal in magnitude to the weight. 
Um, and that's just a description of what I just gave. All right, so we have uh, a situation here where we have the center of gravity of an object um, ends up being over here. This is the object that replaces all the fluid that we just sucked out somehow. That fluid happened to have a center of gravity that was right there. And so the buoyant force was acting on it and we can model things as if it was acting on the center of gravity right there. Let's say we take some weird object that happens to fit that entire surface profile, put it in there in its stead. The center of gravity for that particular object somehow happens to end up right here. So that the object's center of gravity doesn't coincide with center of gravity of the fluid. Because of that, the buoyant force exerts a torque about the object, causing that object to start to rotate. Uh, because the object's weight is greater in magnitude than the buoyant force, the object also sinks. So, an object whose average density is less than that of the liquid can float partially submerged at a free upper surface of the liquid. The greater the density of the liquid, the less the object is submerged. So when you swim in seawater, your body floats higher than in fresh water. And as unlikely as it may seem, lead actually floats in mercury. So um, let's say you've got an hydrometer here. And these are going to be used for measuring the density of the fluid. The depth to which the weighted scale here sinks tells you about the density of the fluid. So using a hydrometer to measure the density of battery acid or antifreeze. They used to sell these kinds of things in um, auto parts store, and they, they still may, that have a certain number of uh, little, uh, little ball-like objects that are here, where if you go in and you, you pull this up, depending on how many objects that you have floating, tells you what the density of the fluid is. So the calibrated float sinks into the fluid until the weight of the fluid is displaced, that it displaces is exactly equal to its own weight. And the hydrometer floats higher in denser liquids than it does in less dense liquids. Um, it's weighted at its bottom end so that the upright position is stable. And then you've got a scale that uh, permits you to read the uh, density readings. Uh, have some discussions over that. So the problems are all kind of worked out there for you. So that's good. All right, surface tension and capillarity. So you may have seen some types of situations here in which, um, you know, fluid may not necessarily um, act in a way that you might expect. And one of the descriptions that we have here to try to uh, describe that are going to be surface tension and capillarity. So if you've got a boundary surface, between a liquid and a gas, that's going to behave like a surface that's under tension, yeah, thus the name surface tension. So when a liquid gas interface meets a, a solid surface, the interface is concave if the liquid is attracted to the solid and convex if it's not. In other words, is it trying to get away or is it trying to get closer? Um, in a related phenomenon of capillarity, a liquid climbs up a narrow tube if it wets the tube's material, but is pushed down by the tube if it does not. Um, so you can see here, uh, if you've got surface molecules, certain uh, molecules running along the surface here, uh, if you have asymmetric attraction, you can kind of see this uh, activity going on here. Or if you look interior to this, you may have more of a symmetric situation.
So let's say you've got a liquid that emerges from the tip of a pipette uh, or a medicine dropper as a succession of drops and not as a continuous stream. You've got a paper clip if you place it carefully on a water surface, and I don't know if you've ever tried that or not, uh, but it makes a small depression in the surface and rests without sinking, even though its density is several times that of water. Uh, some insects can walk on the surface of the water. Um, you know, their feet make indentions in the surface without penetrating. So you can see these kinds of uh, situations here. Uh, water striders. Yeah, okay. Um, so you can see here, these are all uh, where the surface of the liquid is uh, under tension. In other words, there's a, a force there acting on it. Um, and you can see another example here where you attach a loop of thread uh, to a wire ring and you dip the ring and thread into a soap solution and remove it, uh, forming a thin film of liquid in which the three, the thread floats freely. If you puncture that film, then the, the thread uh, springs out to a circular shape like this. So you can see the uh, water molecules um, here at the surface. Uh, there's unbalanced attractions causing uh, that cause the surface to uh, resist being stretched. Uh, molecules in the interior are equally attracted in all directions. So a drop of liquid in free fall in a vacuum is always spherical in shape. It's never teardrop shaped because a surface under tension tends to have the minimum possible area. A sphere has a smaller surface area for a given volume than any other geometric shape. And this is an example of a formation of spherical droplets in a very complex phenomenon, the impact of a drop on a liquid surface. So this is the next thing we're going to discuss. Um, You've got a piece of wire that's bent into a U-shape, and then you've got a second piece of wires, uh, sliders here. When the apparatus is dipped into a soap solution and then removed, the upward surface tension force may be greater in magnitude than the weight of the wire. And if it is, then the slider is pulled up towards the bottom of an inverted U by the upward surface tension force. In other words, you've got uh, tension of somebody pulling on this and you've got the weight, but then you've got the surface tension of this pulling this back. So to hold that in equilibrium, you start pulling on it. Um, molecules will move from the interior of the liquid in which uh, many molecules thick, even in a film, divides it into layers, which are not stretched like a rubber sheet. Instead, more surface is created by the molecules moving from the bulk. So if you've got L being the length here of this wire slider, the film has two surfaces, uh, the upper one and the lower one. Uh, so the surface force acts uh, along a total length of 2L. The surface tension in the film is defined as the ratio of the magnitude F of the surface force to the length D along which the force acts. So surface tension force per unit length, so newtons per meter. In the case of the sliding wire, this is equal to 2L, and therefore your surface tension ends up being this. And then you can see how this uh, surface tension differs for different liquids. As the temperature increases, then the surface tension usually decreases. So the excess pressure inside a soap bubble uh, ends up being this. This comes about experimentally, so we not worry about trying to derive that. Uh, if you look at a liquid drop, which has only one surface film, then the difference between the pressure uh, of the liquid and the pressure of the outside air is half of that for a soap bubble. It just happens to work out like that. So uh, when a gas liquid interface meets a solid surface, kind of like what you've got here. 
Uh, surface tension causes the interface to curve upwards in a concave shape or curve downwards in a convex shape near the line where it meets the solid surface. Uh, the interface is concave if the fluid wets the solid surface. That is, if the surface attracts the fluid at a molecular level. So in other words, if the molecules of the fluid like the surface, they're going to start to try to collect on it. This is what gives it its concave shape. If they don't, this is what you're going to end up like. So water does happen to wet um, glass. So this is what you see here. Mercury, on the other hand, does not. Uh, water will climb up a glass tube because it's attracted to it. Mercury is actually pushed down. So uh, if you push a thin glass tube into water, the attraction of the glass actually causes the water to climb a certain distance up in the tube. If you push a glass tube into mercury, then it's going to come down. And those two phenomenon called capillarity uh, are responsible for the absorption of water by paper towels. In other words, if you've ever put a, a paper towel uh, onto a, a, you know, a spill or something like that, then you can see capillarity going into action. So again, another application of what's going on here. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we're going to talk about fluid flow and uh, Bernoulli's equation. So an ideal fluid is an incompressible fluid with no viscosity. In other words, the thing of viscosity is uh, something like friction, uh, but you also can't uh, compress it, um, can't make it smaller just by pushing on it. A flow line is the path of a fluid particle. In laminar, and this it can also be read as smooth, uh, so in smooth or laminar flow, layers of fluid slide smoothly past each other. In turbulent flow, there's disorder and a constantly changing flow pattern. So let's kind of take a look here. Uh, at uh, some of these sections before we go much further. This is what's meant uh, by a flow lines. You can kind of see those uh, here. And this is an object that it has to work around. Here's another object, here's a third object, that kind of thing. So uh, fluid is gonna flow from left to right around those obstacles. Um, if you inject dye into water uh, flowing between two closely spaced glass plates, this is what you're going to see. So this is what you're going to see regarding laminar flow, in which adjacent layers of fluid slide smoothly past each other. At successively high flow rates, or when boundary surfaces uh, uh, change abrupt Let's try that again. At sufficiently high flow rates or when boundary surfaces cause abrupt changes in velocity, the flow becomes irregular and chaotic, and that is defined as tur turbulent flow. <clears throat> uh, smoke rising from a candle or an incense stick typically exhibits laminar flow near the bottom and then breaks up into these chaotic swirls as it becomes turbulent. In turbulent flow, there's no steady state pattern. It just changes continuously. We're going to look at conservation of mass and fluid flow, um, which is going to lead to the continuity equation. Uh, the essence is going to be contained in the familiar maxim, still waters run deep. So if the flow rate of a river uh, with constant width is the same everywhere along a certain length, then the water has to run faster where it is shallow than where it is deep. So let's, um, if we have a stream of water uh, from a faucet, and let's say it tapers down in width because the water speeds up as it falls at a smaller diameter 
and a smaller diameter is needed to change the same volume flow rate as at the top. So let's say we've got um, fluid here in a tube with changing cross-sectional area. So you've got a certain velocity here and then you've got a certain velocity here and you're watching the area change. This product A times V is going to be constant for an incompressible fluid. So um, we've looked at two points there. During a small time interval, the fluid A sub 1 uh, moves a certain distance of V sub 1 times uh, delta T. So it moves that distance. The volume of fluid uh, delta V1 that flows into the tube across A1 during this interval is the fluid in the cylindrical element with base A1 and height of this. So that's the volume. If you take this area, multiply it by its height, this is that change in volume. That's what you see there. If that density of the fluid is rho, then the mass here that flows into the tube across A during that time is the density multiplied by that volume. So the change in mass ends up being this product. Uh, similar, similarly, the mass uh, delta M2 that flows out across this area, again, the area multiplied by the height there, which happens to be this, uh, ends up equaling this. If you have a steady flow, then the total mass in the tube is constant. So the two masses must be equal. In other words, the mass that flows through here must be the same as the mass that flows through here, which means you put all of this junk equal to each other. Cancel out the rows because they're the same. Cancel out the time because it's the same. And this is the product you're left with. So the continuity equation here expresses the conservation of mass for, for an incompress incompressible fluid flowing in a tube or some other channel. So it says that the amount of fluid flowing through a cross section of the tube is in a given time interval must be the same for all cross sections. If that's the case, then this must be true. This product is going to be the volume flow rate. And if you take uh, delta M divided by delta T, you come up with this. And that is going to be the mass flow rate, or the time rate at which a given mass crosses a section of the tube. All right, so let's see where we are here. Equation 113.10, which is right there. Okay. So this right here. Um, so if you've got a relatively straight, slow moving waterway, then the movement of the water approximates laminar flow. Adjacent layers of water slide smoothly past each other with little mixing. Um, as it approaches a bend in the river, it becomes slightly turbulent and the water on the outside of the bend has to travel faster than the water on the inside, just like what you would see at a, a racetrack. The turbulence causes erosion of the outside riverbank due to the higher flow and results in the deposition of suspended sediment on the inside riverbank as the water there slows. So this combined process leads to an ever widening series of bends and turns, a phenomenon known as meandering. And this is characteristic of rivers on flat plains. So, as you might expect, when the cross section of the tube decreases, then the speed of flow increases. Uh, so the shallow part of a river has a smaller cross section and a faster current than the deep part. But the volume flow rates are going to be the same in both. So if you have a water pipe with a 2 cm diameter and it's connected to a pipe with a 1 cm diameter, then the flow speed is going to be four times as great in the 1 cm part as in the 2 cm part. So we've uh, derived the continuity equation for steady flow 
in a physically distinct tube pipe or channel. Uh, however, larger steady flow patterns can be thought of as a bundle of side-by-side -side tubes uh, with imaginary boundaries and separating, uh, separating adjacent tubes. If you don't have any mixing, then the fluid in each tube behaves according to this, which is the equation we just looked at. Um, Let's go to 13.6, Bernoulli's equation. So we're going to use those concepts in 13.5 along with the work energy theorem to come up with Bernoulli's equation. So we're going to start out here using a general form of the work energy theorem. In other words, the sum of the change in the kinetic plus the change in the potential energy has to be the work. In this case, the gravitational potential energy is what we're going to have here. Work is going to be done by the forces, um, or work is the work done by the forces whose work is not included uh, here. So we compute all three of those, and then we come up, uh, we're going to come up with the equation. So we've noticed here before that the change in volume here is going to be the area times uh, S1, or the change in S1. Same thing is going to be going on over here. That change in volume has to be the same in both cases if we're going through the same, uh, if we're going through a smooth flow. So <clears throat> um, the network done on the segment by the adjacent fluid during this displacement is going to be the difference between these two. So we're going to look here as we combine that these two expressions into one change in volume. Then we're really looking at the change in the pressures here divided by that change in volume. So that's going to be the, um, the work. If we look at the change in the gravitational uh, potential energy, we're going to be looking here at the density times the change in the volume times the gravity times the height difference. So it, think of MGH, we're just doing it with fluid. And then if we look at the change in the kinetic energy, um, you might remember the change in the kinetic energy before as being one half mv squared. Same thing here. We're just taking the mass and we're writing it in terms of density and volume. And then we're doing the, the uh, differences here in the velocity. So if we take those differences and multiply by these other factors out here, we get the change in the kinetic energy. So in short, putting all of that junk together, we come up with this. If we take it and we divide both sides here by delta V, then we end up with this and this. So the change in the pressure here is going to be the same as this expression plus this expression. So that's kind of cool, I think. So now, in order to make your life uh, more interesting, we're going to take all of the terms that involve one and put them on one side take all of the terms that involve two, put them on the other side, and these can represent, one and two can represent any two points along the flow tube. So <clears throat> since the flow rate is constant, this and this should be the same. The question is how do these individual things change as you go through the tube? So that was a mouthful. So now let's go to 
So we've got um, speed of efflux or Torricelli's theorem. So we've got a gas tank, a gasoline storage tank here. It's got a cross-sectional area A of one of uh, A1 on top. It's filled to a particular depth. It's got a uh, liquid of density rho. Not exactly sure what it is, so we just call it rho. Um, space above the gasoline is vent to the atmosphere. Uh, so it contains air at atmospheric pressure. And the gasoline flows out through a short pipe here with area two. So how fast does it flow out? Um, if we go through and we apply Bernoulli's equation to points one and two, which we're defining this, the, the top of the surface here is one. Uh, some part here where it's flowing out is two. And we're calling the uh, difference between one and two here. We're gonna have a, a height there. If we go through and if we put what we know into this particular equation, we know um, that the height of uh, our Y2 at the bottom of the tank, we're gonna define that as a height of zero. We're gonna define Y1 as a height of H. So we get this expression. We know that the atmospheric pressure out there is what we're having at the top. Uh, we know here that this is also going to be at atmospheric pressure. We know how to take that uh, rho times G times H term. We know what it is here. We know what it is over here canceled out because that height is going to be zero. And we know the velocities here. Our, we, we know what these terms are if we knew what the velocities were. Um, the book is going to make the argument here that since the, the area area for A2 is much smaller than A1, therefore this is going to be much smaller than this. And so they're just going to kind of throw this term out. They do that because they can. What remains is this expression. And so now we know what the velocity is, or at least a good approximation of it there. They're saying that this should look familiar to you. Now, when you have an object of mass M falling from a height A, conservation of mechanical energy requires that this be true, or that the velocity is equal to this. So the speed of efflux uh, from an opening at a distance H uh, below the top surface of a liquid is the same as the speed of a body would acquire in a freely falling object through that height. Um, it's really, and they argue that it's not that surprising. You have uh, the same type of thing going on here with the collapse of a blood vessel. So arteriosclerosis, you may not be familiar with that term, but the term actually means a hardening of the artery. Sclerosis is a hardening, arterio, of course, meaning artery. Um, one aspect of the, of the disease is a narrowing of the blood vessel due to the buildup of plaque on the vessel wall. And the disease is considered critical when a portion of the vessel becomes 80% blocked. So in other words, four fifths of it is, is blocked off at that point. What is a drop in blood pressure when blood flowing at this enters that particular region? Well, if we go through, <laughs> we can use our cross-sectional uh, relationship here of how that works out. And if we know what the, uh, we don't even have to know what the area is. We just have to know what the percentage is of this new area compared to the old area. And we know it's 20% of that original area. We substitute that in. We know what the velocity is of, uh, of blood going through the vessel at that point. This is what happens when the blood uh, starts getting to that point. You can see how it speeds up. Once you have all of that information, you can go back to Bernoulli's equation. Uh, they're at the same height. So to find the drop in the blood pressure in that narrow region, we know what the density of blood approximately is. So we find the drop by filling all of this information in, and this is what we come up with. So a pressure drop of that magnitude uh, can act to collapse the blood vessel. And once you've got a closed blood vessel, that can be really, really bad. <laughs>
we have some information here on the Venturi meter um, used to measure flow speed in a pipe. Um, the narrow part of the pipe is called the throat. Because A1 is greater than A2, and V2 is going to be greater than V1, and the pressure in the throat is less than that of V1. So the difference in height of the two vertical tubes is directly related to that V1 velocity. If you apply Bernoulli's equation to the wide point, you can derive a relationship between the height and the velocity, and it comes up with this. They don't bother to go through the details. Um, and you've also got some description here uh, regarding a, a curveball. So that could be some interesting numbers. So finally, let's get back to the summary. So real fluids have viscosity. In other words, they real fluids have some tendency to sort of resist that movement. You can think of it sort of like an inertia. So the boundary layer fluid in contact with a stationary wall or surface is nearly at rest, whereas flow speeds uh, peak in the center of a pipe or the channel. Flow is typically laminar at low speeds and at higher speeds it starts to become turbulent. So uh, it can play a vital low in, a role in the flow of fluids in pipes, uh, the flow of blood, lubrication of engine parts, and many other areas of practical importance. Um, you have to be able to model that. How well we're going to do that here is, is another matter. But um, a viscous fluid always tends to cling to a surface that's in contact with it. So there's always a thin boundary layer of fluid near the surface in which the fluid is almost at rest. It, it wants to stay bound. It doesn't want to move. So that's why you can have dust particles cling to a flam fan blade even when it's rotating rapidly. And sometimes you can't get all the mud off the car by squirting a hose at it. So what this is saying here is that the flow speed through a pipe of a uh, particularly of a, a fluid that's going to have some viscosity, is going to be greatest going through the center. The closer you get out to the edges, the slower that fluid is going to be. So that's what you're going to encounter here in chapter 13. I know I went through a lot, um, but I actually find fluids to be uh, somewhat uh, interesting, and it's a little bit different from some of the stuff that you've been looking at up to this point. Um, do you guys have any questions? Are you still awake? I don't have any questions. Okay. All right. Well, you've got the uh, homework there in front of you, and then you've got uh, some other examples or whatnot. Um, that's all I've got for this evening. Um, if, uh, if you don't have anything else, then that'll be it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a nice night. All right. Y'all too. <laughs>